Welcome back to another episode of the Believe in Minnesota Football podcast hosted by me, Tony Liebert. As always, you can follow me on Twitter at Tony Liebert and Instagram and TikTok at Tony underscore Liebert. For today's episode, we will be previewing the Gophers Week 12 matchup at Ohio State. 27 and a half point underdogs, the second biggest spread in the PJ Fleck era as it relates to the Gophers being an underdog. The highest was the last time the Gophers played in Columbus in 2018 when uh, they did lose to Ohio State in that game, obviously. But uh, 27 and a half point underdogs over under is 50 points. 3 p.m. kickoff on Big Ten Network. Another afternoon game for the Golden Gophers. For um, this game, a few things. Obviously, everyone knows Ohio State is one of the best teams in the country. National championship contender, the second of those that the Gophers have played this season. Uh, first of which was Michigan. Um, now the Gophers get the counterpart in the Big Ten East with the Buckeyes from Ohio State. OSU opened the season with a sloppy win against Indiana in week one in Bloomington, and they hosted um, FCS Ohio School, Youngstown State, convincing win, convincing win versus Western Kentucky, went on the road against Notre Dame, had an impressive 17-14 win, kind of a turning point of their season, and they blew out Maryland, blew out Purdue, Beat Wisconsin at or beat Penn State at home, excuse me, in uh, a very big game. Um, a lot of people thought that might be coming out party for Penn State, but Ohio State stuck it to them. Then they went at Wisconsin, won kind of in a sloppy game there, too. And then they uh, won at Rutgers, another sloppy game that they were losing at halftime. And then, um, Last week, they hosted Michigan State and won in convincing fashion. So, Ryan Day, this is now his fifth season as full-time head coach. And um, anyone that follows college football, follows Big Ten, knows who Ohio State's star players are this year. Marvin Harrison Jr., one of the best players in college football. The fourth uh, best betting odds for the Heisman Trophy at the moment. Um, star wide receiver, almost a lock to be the first wide receiver uh, selected in next spring's NFL draft, son of Hall of Famer Marvin Harrison, obviously. Um, Denzel Burke, one of the best defensive backs in the country, is their number one cornerback, probably their second best player on their team. Tommy Eichenberg, starting middle linebacker, very talented guy in the middle. Um, Mecca Igbuka who is also a potential first-rounder wide receiver, kind of dealt with injuries this year, but still an incredibly talented player. Josh Proctor, another top maybe 50 NFL draft pick, certainly top 100 at the safety position. And then uh, Kyle McCord, their starting redshirt sophomore QB, who um, had a, a lot of hype coming into Columbus, and his first year has been up and down, but still a very talented player. So, um, given all the circumstances, the Gophers are amidst one of their most frustrating losing streaks of the P.J. Fleck era, and it obviously does not get easier with a road game against Ohio State. So, uh, Minnesota obviously needs to win one of the last two games to be bowl eligible at six wins. There are some rumors that there might not be enough six-win teams, and the Gophers... um, GPA as a team might get them into a bowl game, but that is a different story for a different day. So in this one, PJ Fleck looks to become the first Big Ten head coach other than Jim Harbaugh to beat Ryan Day. Ryan Day has only lost two conference games as a head coach of the Buckeyes, which have came to Jim Harbaugh both times. Get into it a little bit, but they obviously lost to Georgia last year in the college football playoff. They uh, have a loss to Oregon in the non-conference, a loss to Clemson in the college football playoff. And I believe they had another non-conference loss in there. Um, but nevertheless, Ryan Day gets a lot of hate when it comes to high-level college football because he has struggled with Michigan. 
but I still think he is a tremendous football coach. Very interesting personality, but he knows what he's doing. So some storylines heading into this year for the Buckeyes. Um, I think the biggest one is, are they too focused on Michigan? So um, obviously Michigan story has controlled college football this season. Um, biggest story in college football in a while, maybe. But Ohio State's directly connected to that. A lot of rumors. Did Ryan Day hire his brother to do a private investigation into the Michigan program? I have no idea if that's true. A, that is an absolutely wild story. B, the fact that it's even a rumor is crazy and tells you that um, Ohio State clearly is up to something. I don't know what it is. I don't know if Michigan's just trying to frame them, but clearly there's a lot of the rivalry continuing off the field in this situation. So I think the question still arises, are the Buckeyes too focused on the Wolverines? Like I mentioned earlier, Ryan Day has not lost to a Big Ten coach, not named Jim Harbaugh. So for good reason, they are dialed in on Michigan last game of the year. But... When that happens, when you have a bunch of young adults, teenagers playing football, there's a chance to overlook an opponent. And obviously, this game is being played in Columbus, Ohio, so, and the Gophers are coming off two straight losses. So it is certainly not one you circle for Ohio State overlooking. That might have been the Wisconsin game earlier in the year that would make the most sense throughout the season, off the Penn State game, off the Notre Dame game. Nobody circles that one. Always tough to play in Camp Randall. So, um, obviously, that game was kind of one that everyone circled. Now that this is at home, no one's really circling this game. But, again, you got what could be the best um, college football regular season game in the last decade plus on the horizon. So, um, certainly can't overlook any opponent as uh, college football proves that time after time. Um, No matter... If you're Alabama, no matter if you're Georgia, there's always an upset possible. So, is Ohio State too focused on Michigan? I don't think so. Um, I think it's just a little bit of the media driving it up. Obviously, anyone in, that works in national college football media realizes that more people talking about the game is good for their business. So, I think it's just a little bit of that. And But you can still always hypothesize. Um, it, it could be. It could be too much. could be too little. You never know. Certainly something to watch because it, it definitely is talked about enough, but I, I'm not within the Ohio State program, so I don't know. But um, certainly interesting story to follow. Number two, I think the biggest story for Ohio State heading into this year's um, personnel-wise was replacing C.J. Stroud at the quarterback position. C.J. Stroud was a tremendous quarterback um, at Ohio State. Never got over the hump, though. Two losses to Michigan, so it was tough for him in that category. No Big Ten championship. Still a supreme talent that we're now seeing in the NFL is the front runner for NFL Rookie of the Year. So, who's Kyle McCord now? Uh, McCord is a redshirt sophomore who's been in the program for a little bit. Same rec- recruiting class as Ethan Kaliak Manis. McCord was a top 50 overall prospect, four-star recruit, So a very, very talented player that had some expectations coming to Columbus. But when you get recruits like CJ Stroud, Justin Fields, Quinn Ewers, uh, Devin Brown coming through, Kyle McCord, just another name at Ohio State, but still a very, very talented player. And those expectations I was talking about only ramped up with Two future first-round NFL draft picks, Marvin Harrison Jr. and Emeka Igbuka in the wide receiver room. Then you throw in Julian Fleming, who is a former five-star, and Carnell Tate, who is a true freshman, number one receiver in the country. So they have a uberly talented wide receiver room. So expectations are still there for a player like McCord that has not had much experience heading into the year. So, in the offseason, though, there's plenty of talk that McCord might not start week one. Um, True freshman, or redshirt freshman, Devin Brown, was a four-star himself. Another top 50 prospect, according to 24-7 Sports. They had a tough QB battle back and forth. 
And it looked like McCord had slightly edged him out, said he was going to get the start against Indiana, but Devin Brown still played a lot in that game. Not a lot, but he still played sparingly. And McCord struggled. He went had 239 yards for zero touchdowns in an INT. And I mentioned how it was kind of a snooze fest in that game, 23-3 win, that I think kind of encompasses this Ohio State team. Um, They are a more physical team. They like to grind you out. They don't like to win 55-0 like they did maybe years past with Chris Olave, Garrett Wilson, and Justin Fields. Kind of a different team, and I think it showed that in uh, week one. And I think Kyle McCord has shown that because he's kind of grinded through the season. Zero touchdowns, one pick in game one. He's had 19 touchdowns and three picks since. So starting to find his rhythm. Marvin Harrison Jr. is playing like arguably the best player in the country. Um, That's another argument for a different day, but um, he is firmly in the Heisman Trophy conversation, and for good reason. He is one of the best players in the entire sport, if not the best, regardless of position. So, this certainly isn't the same explosive offense that it was under uh, Dwayne Haskins, Justin Fields, or C.J. Stroud. This team has only scored 40 plus points once against a uh, power five team. It it done it twice against FBS teams against um, Western Kentucky and uh, Purdue. They scored 37 against Maryland. So basically what I'm saying is this isn't the same explosive offense. They scored 38 against Michigan state, but they still have the guys that they can score on any play but it's not kind of the quick fire stuff it's been in the past. But they are still very good, and they still have the talent. So this offseason, I think they kind of determined that they've lost four games since 2021. They lost that early non-conference game to Oregon when Mario Cristobal was still there. C.J. Stroud's probably worst game in a Buckeyes uniform. Then they lost to Georgia last year in the college football semifinal, and they lost to Michigan twice. I think there is a common theme in all four of those games. All four of those teams, three programs, are more physical, were more physical than them in those matchups. So I think Ryan Day kind of went out and said, we need it, he needs to change the way he, he coaches. That's why I think he's an elite football coach, something that um, a man that resides in Dinkytown might need to think of going for. Going further, going forward, but Brian Day is like, okay, I know we can score whenever we want, but that's clearly not working. So let's be a defensive team. We see Georgia, we see Alabama win all these national titles. Why are they doing it? Because they grind you out. They peak at the right time. They peak at the end of the year, and they realize what wins games in December and January don't always win games in October and November might be a little different. So, Ryan Day went out, hired Jim Knowles as defensive coordinator, and it's really paid out off for him last year. It started to, but this year it's kind of really came full circle. Um, Ohio State has the second-ranked scoring defense in the entire country, allowing only 9.9 points per game, which is... Yeah, 9.9. I was looking at their box score. I'm like, that. how does that math add up? But, um, yeah, so they, they arguably have the best defense in the entire country. Um, I'd say they do. And uh, the team no longer wants to just outscore you, like I was saying. That was kind of their philosophy before. Now they want to physically dominate you for 60 minutes, which is kind of that SEC football style that Nick Saban, Kirby Smart, kind of that Nick Saban coaching tree has done. And on the defensive side of the ball, um, JT... Kuimulowau is the type of defensive lineman who could take over a game whenever he wants. He did it against Penn State two years ago, did it a little bit against Penn State this week, and uh, defensive tackle Tyleek Williams and linebacker Tommy Eichenberg are two of the more physical defensive players in the entire conference. And I think their win against Penn State and Notre Dame kind of encompassed what everyone was saying about this team preseason. They're going to be more physical. They're going to grind you out. Those are games in the past that I think they'd kind of get themselves into a shootout. And 
uh, the defense would kind of let up all these big plays, and then the offense would kind of save them. Completely different th- different uh, pattern in both those games. That Notre Dame game came down right to the end, and they won uh, just grinding them out. And that Penn State game, one score game, twenty to twelve. That that seems like a game a few years ago might have been might have been forty to twenty one, and while it might have looked better on the scoreboard. I feel like you learn more about Ohio State in that game that you don't want to mess with them and they're going to keep coming at you for 60 minutes and they are just a dominant physical grinding team and you can't get it twisted. You might look at the score, the uh, box scores and be like, hey, this barely beat a pretty subpar Notre Dame team, subpar Penn State team, two teams that I think could arguably be top 12 to 10 teams in the country. Obviously, their losses have came at odd times. But when those two teams are playing their best, they are tough outs. They went on the road at Notre Dame and beat Penn State at home. So still a very, very good football team and one of the best in the country, one of the best under Ryan Day, in my opinion. So where do the Gophers fall into all this? The last time Minnesota beat Ohio State, Bill Clinton was president, and I was not alive. Um, that was in 2000, and it was in Columbus. So, if the Gophers want want to come away with a win here, I I believe that would be the biggest upset of the sport all season, kind of by a wide margin. I was trying to think what the other one would be, um, but uh, I th- I think maybe like Georgia Tech over Miami, but it, it would be a big upset. And in my uh, little preview for the game on Gopher Roll, I mentioned the Gophers knocking off Ohio State in this situation. I pictured it in my head that it would remind me of, for those MMA fans out there, I, I don't know how many are there, but um, Nate Diaz and Conor McGregor, one of the biggest rivalries in the history of combat sports in the UFC, uh, Diaz beat Conor McGregor uh, handing him his first UFC loss at 197. And Joe Rogan uh, famously asked asked him and kind of just told him, he said, Nate Diaz, you just shook up the world. And then he said, uh, I'm not effing surprised, but um, that would kind of be what would need to happen in this game. If it did happen, <laughs> I think that's kind of the, the scenario because I talked about how big the Ohio State-Michigan game would be um, I think Conor McGregor in that moment kind of was like, ooh, I'm going to fight Floyd Mayweather. I'm going to do all this stuff. It's going to be this massive moment. Um, I, I just need to beat up on little Nate Diaz, who uh, has a lot of bumps and scratches and uh, certainly wasn't the cleanest path for him to get there into that big fight with McGregor. And this Minnesota team, they've had a lot of bumps and scratches, and it hasn't been the cleanest path for him to get into this big game against Ohio State in front of a big audience. Everyone watches the Buckeyes. And they need to keep, catch them lacking, kind of how Nick Diaz did against Conor McGregor. That's the only way it's going to happen. And um, you can hypothesize all of that, but it would be that level of an upset, in my opinion. And Minnesota would have to play its best game of the season perfectly for 60 minutes, and Ohio State would have to completely implode at the same time. A lot like it was kind of in that fight. That was Nate Diaz's best performance as a mixed martial artist, and Conor McGregor completely was uh, lost in that fight. He was overly confident. He was overextending himself, and then he got rocked, and then he got submitted. His first ever loss in the UFC octagon. And it would kind of be a similar situation here. The Gophers come out unorthodox style. They're uh, doing a lot of stuff that Ohio State hasn't seen before. That's kind of what would need to happen if I was giving anyone advice on that team. But um, in all honesty, what would need to happen is Ohio State would have to have a couple mistakes early in this game. Um, Tyler Newbin, I think, would have to make two to three game-changing plays if that is um, a turnover or two here or massive pass breakup or a big sack. He he needs a handful of those in these in this game. You need your best player to make plays. 
And you need Ethan Kelly Fantas to have his best career game. That's the only way they're winning this. I, I think you need at least 303 touchdowns. We've seen that Ohio State's not a team that puts up godly-like numbers. So it's not like you're going to have to put up 55 points in this game. I think if the upset somehow did happen, it could be high 30s, low 40s. But um, I, I don't think you're going to out Ohio State at their own game. You kind of almost have to make it a high-scoring affair, which is obviously something that Minnesota is not built for. But I think that's the only way you beat this Ohio State team. Um, watching them like Ohio State versus Washington, I just thought of that would be a very interesting game. And Oregon, um, to, watching them play a team with a very explosive offense would be very fascinating. Um, the Gophers obviously don't have that this year, but that's, I think, how you beat them. You need to have these big plays, these big moments. And Wisconsin didn't have those necessarily. They kind of tried to out, out, uh, gun them in their own game, which can only take you so far, I think. And if the Gophers did that, I think there's a chance they cover the spread. I don't know how competitive the game is, but um, I, I would assume that's what they're going to do because um, I have no evidence to think that P.J. Fleck would change his game plan that dramatically. But, um, yeah, you were, would need your big players to make big-time plays. Newbin needs two to three big plays. Ethan needs 300 plus yards, three touchdowns. You need Darius Taylor to play. I don't have any specifics of his injury, but you need him on the field if you're going to win this game. I don't think you're going to win it without him. You need Brevin Span Ford to get um, a big touchdown, maybe four or five catches, 80 yards. You need to get Daniel Jackson involved. You need Justin Wally to make some big plays. Getting Cody Lindenberg back would be huge. Um, you need those guys to show up. That's the only way you win these games um, in Minnesota's position. I don't think it's going to happen, but I just told you that's what needs to happen. And um, I think Minnesota does cover the spread. I, I I think it's kind of a game Ohio State, if I had to predict what's going to happen, I think Ohio State comes out fast. we a couple early. Um, Minnesota it makes a couple adjustments. And Ohio State really lets up a little bit. And I think um, the Buckeyes come out on top 35-10. Kind of as at the end of the game, they're like, okay, we got a big game next week. Take your starters out. Take Marvin Harrison out. Take Al McCord out. Take uh, Travion Henderson out. And you kind of get ready for the game in week 13. Um, but, yeah, this obviously isn't a game that the Gophers are expecting to win. So being competitive would be a big win in my opinion. Got to take each game by game. It's very coach speak to take, say the Ohio State we go 1-0 this week, but it's kind of what you have to do even as a fan. Um, I think the uh, big loss here really doesn't change anything in the grand scheme of things. But um, being competitive in a big win, I think, would give you a little momentum going into the Wisconsin game, and you try to end the year on a high note. Um, that's really all you can do at this point. And I It'll be a good opportunity to learn a lot about some more players against uh, some top top competition, and um, yeah, it it'll be a, I don't think it'll be a pretty game, but any anything uh, more than that would be a win in my book. So I think we'll wrap this week's episode up there. As always, I appreciate you guys for listening. Row the boat, Skyuba, and go Gophers.